So, good evening again. Um, uh, I think everybody's ready to uh, start the discussion. <laughs> so, to, um, we have a very interesting topic uh, to discuss about uh, because it's complicated, it's complex, and uh, I think there are many uh, conflicting opinions on, on, on this issue of uh, uh, do firms have a nationality? Uh, the, the easy answer, of course, is yes, they have a nationality because there's, there's always a headquarter somewhere uh, located in a country. But then, uh, at the same time, those firms tend to uh, uh, say that they are global, and, and it's true also because they, their customers are everywhere. They operate in, in talking about big firms in, in sometimes over 100 countries. Uh, and, uh, but still, they, they still have uh, a, an origin uh, in a country, they still have their, their own uh, DNA, and so this, this whole issue is, is complex, and, and also the, in, in, in a context of uh, crisis in some countries, uh, uh, if not globally, uh, governments tend to uh, uh, have a different relationship with with their big firms in 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 each country and uh, and in Europe in particular, uh, you see that kind of uh, trend going on. So there are lots of questions on uh, uh, whether the big firms uh, are uh, truly have a nationality or are truly global. So on on this uh, debate, I would like to uh, I mean ask um, maybe uh, Charlotte if you want to start uh, and give us a, a, a few answers on that, and then uh, we'll open the discussion to... Uh... Okay. Uh, I think we all, all see the, uh, this globalization trend since the 80s. Most of our clients, uh, especially in emerging countries, they only look at the Fortune 500, and they see themselves as a global giant. Uh, and that's how they want to become uh, something different. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're seeing what I call the seventh continent, which is this world of data with this, all these uh, new companies emerging, which seems to have no nationality, connecting billions of people. So people feel like this is globalized and uh, there is no more nationality. But when you look at uh, geopolitics, when you look at economy, you see that uh, at the end of the day, uh, there is something behind the companies. There is a nationality. Uh, from the management consulting, from the management side, what we see is any company has three ingredients in the way it's thinking and operating. The first one, of course, is, I call it the land or the government. This is the rules of the game in, from the country where they operate. The legislation, the facility, the easiness to do business. The second dimension is the people they employ. The energy level of the people they employ, especially from their mother country, because usually there is a, a lot of people from this home country, whether they are French, Japanese, Americans or Chinese. And last but not least, and this is emerging, and we see it, and I think this is something for our debate, culture, legacy, the roots, uh, I call it the spirit of a company. And I think that this complexity between this globalization and at the end of the day, this rooted somewhere, Japanese call it the gamba, the place, uh, I think that this is how we, we should frame our discussion. Okay, you touched upon Japan, but we'll, we'll see that afterwards. In the US, how do you see that? Well, we, uh, at my firm, we advise, when I'm not talking about politics, I'm actually doing work for companies, uh, and we advise multinationals on how to do business all around the world. So we're helping them deal with governments around the world. Uh, not just American companies, but European companies, Asian companies, companies like uh, Google and GE and Walmart and Hyundai and others. Uh, the first piece of advice we always give them when they're operating in a country is try to be as local as you can be. Uh, you arrive as an American company, you arrive as a European company, try to become as local as you can. Understand who your suppliers are, understand who your customers are, your local suppliers, your local customers, Build stakeholder bases with them so that when an issue strikes you with the government, with the regulator, with the competitor, you can walk in with a local face. 
to that government. Now, for some companies, this becomes uh, an inexorable part of their business model. Uh, Google, for example. When I'm in the United States and I go to Google, I go to www.google.com. <coughs> when I'm here in Switzerland, I go to google.ch. When I'm in Germany, DE, and so on. Google wants to be local because if a government in Germany, say, says you cannot have Mein Kampf published in Germany, yes. if mm. I go to google.com in the US, I can pull up the text of Mein Kampf. When I am in Germany and I go to google.de, I try to pull up the text of Mein Kampf and it says, I'm sorry, we cannot provide that to you. So a company like Google has to be local in order to comply with laws, even though we all know the data lives, as you said, in the seventh continent in, in nowhere. Uh, the last point I'd make, and I hope we can come back to this, is I think that uh, despite companies wanting to be local, it's impossible for them to run away from their national origins and from the flag that they, that they carry, in part because in today's world, yes, we're globalized, but then as the events in Paris, tragic events in Paris last week showed us, sometimes borders matter a lot. And sometimes uh, it will matter to a US government that a company is Chinese, or it will matter to a Chinese government that a company is European or that it's Japanese. And so I think as much as companies want to be local, uh, governments for both good and bad reasons are often gonna to wanna to treat them with the flag of their home country. By the way, we had a very good example of that uh, difficulty of yeah. companies yeah. pretending to be local and, and in fact being global. Uh, you, you, you know, just after the attacks in Paris, uh, uh, some companies like Apple, uh, Amazon posted messages saying, well, we uh, support the French, uh, etc." And then on, on social networks, you had all sorts of messages saying, well, start paying taxes in our country and then we'll be able to uh, finance the police, the military, etc." So. They pretend to be local, but for the general public, it's, it's obvious that uh, they're not really local. Exactly right. And you look at the initial that I've heard so much in Europe, GAFA, mm. Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Suddenly, uh, any tech company is viewed as carrying the American flag, embodying American values. Sometimes that's good. Free flow of information, robust discussion, trendy, nouvelle, but also behavior, perhaps they're conspiring with the NSA. Perhaps they're keeping their taxes offshore so they're not really going to be local citizens. And so those things become pejorative phrases yes. uh, as much as they can be advantages. This debate is not as strong in Japan, by the way, but uh, <laughs> strangely. Oh, well, the first time, I, I recall that global cooperation issue is in OECD, we discussed it's in 1980s. At that time, we said multinational cooperation instead of the global. Okay, they say, they, I think the definition is now it's quite a different character, characteristics. For example, like the global cooperation itself is now, they really transformed from the multinational. The multinational had some kind of center of the headquarters with a uh, lot of subsidiaries like Hub and Scope. But the global companies now having the multi-headquarters with the, a lot of factories or subsidiaries with network. And at the same time, the, well, we cannot really identify the nationality because of the, some of the shareholders or something. Okay, because of the globalized capital market, we do not know who is really owning one company together. Even though the name or origin is coming from the United States or from the France or from Germany or someplace, but still, you do not know this. Who is? And global companies, they are supposed to respond to the almost all the interests to shareholders, not to the one country to another. And but why we, we have the, such a global companies right now is because they succeeded in operating globally. The small companies or the some other multinationals, they are not completely succeeding in 
operating globally, like uh, Google's and so on. By the way, I have a Google's email address, but that, that's google.com. Mm. That is not a google.co.jp. That's, that, that's google.com. So that's a real global in that sense, it seems to me. So that's one point. And the second, well, I think as I, I, I experienced 35 years in the government, and we really supported to create global entities by establishing the WTO, what is discussed like just before this session. And we created, so we removed all the, almost all the barriers, and the global companies took its growth, it's all that kind of advantage of the, such a legal framework, but at the same time taking the real good, the advantage of Inter, inter, uh, this information technology, and also this very much convenient air, air, airplane transportation and cheap sea transportation of the goods with the digital data and so on. So they succeeded in that sense the, to, mm -hmm. to be global. But at the same time as well, not only the brand image or the, to, to the public, I think so whether these global companies has made success to be really global without having a, any kind of nationality. I think they, they, they are not succeeded in that sense yet, or maybe not forever. The reason is because the, there are many, many kind of the regulations or need from the public in some of the natural, nation, national company, national country. As the person, national person has address or nationality. The legal person, inevitably, they have nationality in that sense. Well, it's the address of the headquarter or the, wherever the operation does, where they are going to pay a tax and so on. Mm -hmm. Of course, they can change address sometime. Like a natural person can change the nationality. Some of the companies can change the nationality from the United States with the heavy tax into this very much light yes, for tax, tax reasons, reasons. Mainly, yes. yes. In that, that way, mm. you can do it. But mm. the, it seems to me, from my legal work, the, for example, like a national security requirement, you cannot really escape any kind of obligation imposed by the national security interest requirement. And the second thing is maybe safety. Safety to the public and working environment and so on. And the, <clears throat> this is the second issue. And the third issue, what is now this coming very much popular in Europe, is the data protection issue. Well, this is ignited by the Snowden and so on. Google or some, let's say Facebook and so on have very much of the difficulty to transfer these, uh, their data into the United States, even though this, we had these EU directives had so-called safe harbor clause, but just recently that was completely denied by the European Court. So the, in that sense, I think we are having some kind of the regulation, and in that sense, the global company cannot be really global without any nationality. Mm -hmm. They have to have nationality in that sense. It may sound a, a little uh, provocative, but don't you think that these big firms understand that they have a, a nationality in terms of, in, in times of crisis? Uh, for example, um, we all know uh, just right after uh, Lehman Brothers, uh, G ran out of cash and they had to call the, the US government for help. Uh, uh, Many years uh, before that, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, nationalized uh, Chrysler, for example, or Continental Illinois Bank. So in times of crisis, these big firms understand that they have a, a nationality and a link with their country of origin. Isn't, isn't that the case? That's right, and they have to be. And we saw it clearly at the height of the financial crisis when uh, the big banks in New York went to the Fed to be bailed out Although, in fact, the reason they needed to be bailed out was because they owed Deutsche Bank so much money or because they owed HSBC so much money mm. or because they owed Japanese banks or others so much money. But each one went race to its home regulator. The poor Icelandic banks got slammed because they had almost all their deposits were from outside of Iceland. 
and yet the small Icelandic government was then required to bail out deposits or to deal with, with deposits that came from all over the world. Cyprus had, Cyprus had the same thing. We learned then that it's actually not so important to be with an institution that's too big to fail, but to make sure that it has its home in a country that's too big to fail, uh, that will live up, that like the Fed can just have unlimited uh, liquidity or like yes. the ECB. Mm. And, uh, I think it's an interesting point because we are seeing more and more the link between the government of the countries and the companies. What you just mentioned is the link of being in the right country that will bail you out, whether it's France or US or Japan. What we see also with the uh, GAFA or now NATU or BAT in China is that these companies or companies can be a source of political leadership. And I was just, uh, as I'm sure you've seen this uh, statement from Barack Obama, but I was uh, personally a bit, not shocked, but I knew that it would be coming. But in February 15 at the uh, Cybersecurity and Consumer Protection uh, Summit, uh, he said, we have owned the internet. Our companies have created it, expanded it, perfected it in a way that they can't compete. So basically, and it's not, I mean, it's a logic. There is this link between companies and countries. And as much as companies are trying to escape and become global, as you said, because in tough times you need the, the countries to support you, they are a source of leadership. And that's the challenge we have as European because some of our countries, some of our institutions have not completely understood that this is a two-way street. You have to protect the companies because it's employment, it's important. But these companies, you have to help them because they are the source of political leadership. Uh, Nessa, how, how do you read this uh, statement from uh, President Obama? Does it, uh, wh what does he really mean when he says we own the internet? Is well, there a strategy behind that, really? Well, or? Yeah, I would take it first as a, <laughs> just a matter of national pride. Uh, mm. the, in many ways, the internet did flourish in the United States. In fact, it right. was, yeah. it was uh, DARPA, which was a, a defense security agency that first funded the first uh, pieces of the internet at, at universities across the U.S. There's a tremendous pride in the U.S. for having had a leading role in, uh, uh, in the internet, and it's obviously been a magnet for both investment to the U.S. and for foreigners coming to the U.S. I was in Silicon Valley just last week, and uh, you go to a restaurant, and yes, there are many Americans there, but there are just as many Chinese and Indians and Europeans there who are all flocking to Silicon Valley because they want to be able to touch whatever magic it is that seems to have been created yes. there. Mm. So I think it was viewed as a matter of pride by President Obama, but I can see why it would rub those outside the United States in the wrong way. Uh, Sano-san, from a Japanese point of view, do you look at the Chinese also having a, a strategy on the internet of uh, maybe not owning the uh, internet, but of trying to uh, dominate parts of this uh, seventh continent, as uh, Charles Edouard uh, called it? You mean, you mean ch China? Mm. I think China wants to create their own independent, certain regime, even in the field of internet, ICT, technology. Well, the one thing is because they can use completely different language than this and some others. Of course, Google's and so others to try to adapt into the Chinese language, but still, this is some of the logic is different. And it's also this is also the infrastructure of the internet itself. It might be this different. And the government can regulate in a certain way. That's the same thing to see in, 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 in Europe too, in that sense. So they say that, I think that China has their own, own idea to keep their sovereignty in that sense. But going back to it about the crisis, it's about the crisis issues and so on. Well, many times that, that is because some of the, the, the government aid is needed. At that time, you need to have the real public support. So the, at that time, the company, even though you are globally operating, you try to say that I have, I, I'm American. <laughs> rather than saying that I'm global. But it's if you are, you, you are very much healthy and it's good enough, you may not say so. You can say the multinational. Like as you said, it's Google, 
You can say this, I'm German, I'm French. You can say this, uh, Amazon could say this, you, 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 so I, I'm Japanese or something. So in that sense, the which side is really asking that about the nationality. The security issue, as I said, is export controls and so on. Many cases, yes, you have address in our country. So you have to follow. And you have to, you have to meet all the requirements given by that company, a country. So this, I think which, which is really using the, such kind of the nationality is mm. very much interesting. And Edouard, you want to... No, it's the point, it's a two-way street. Mm. You know, the government are using the Japanese uh, as a source of leadership, also taxing them and asking them to, right. to belong, to follow the rules and security. And in some countries in the world, uh, companies like BlackBerry have to release the code. You know, so you're encrypting, you think as a consumer you are protected. The government of that country has the code given by the, the company by force. Um, at the same time, it's like uh, with your parents, you feel proud, you go out, you're successful, when you have some troubles, you come back to the family and say, <laughs> can right. I get some help? Yes. <laughs> you know, is my old bed still there in the bedroom? Mm -hmm. And of course, your dad and mom say, yes, I prepared a good soup for you and you're my son. But so the, the example of China, I think, is a very good one because I think for the rest of us, for, for the US, for Europeans, for most other countries that are rising up in the developing world, they feel they benefit from one set of rules, from a global set of rules that everybody can sign on to. I think the Chinese, and many Chinese believe, they benefit from having a separate set of rules, a walled garden in which uh, their rules can prevail. And so you're gonna see these contests of who does regulate the internet? Is it the existing international bodies or are the new Chinese standards going to come in into play? We're seeing it on the trading side, TPP, includes all the major, uh, most of the major Pacific trading partners. It does not include China. Uh, will it ever include China? Possibly. But China would have to decide that it's going to abide by international trading rules rather than by the, the rules that it wishes to expound. But take example like Alibaba. Yes. That's a big inter it's, it's, it's internet company. It's, 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 it's a B2B business and so on. And it show me is the, uh, the big search engine. The example like an Alibaba, they, they are registered in New York Stock Exchange yes. and they got a huge amount of money there. Mm. We do not know who, who is the real shareholder of Alibaba right now. And at the same time, because registered in New York, they have to be regulated. They have to follow all that kind of national security requirements. That is not the China. That's the they have to have multi jurisdictional regulations, of course. But at the same time, Alibaba could be regulated by the American the security requirements and so on. So the, many of the global companies cannot be completely, what to say, without any nationality. If that is coming to be the global, and it's as well, for the tax reason, they can, they can move to somewhere else. But that is the national government policies to attract such kind of the global company who may be capable to pay a huge amount of the money as a tax. So everybody wants to give some of the credit to them. So that is a competition amongst the government. That is not the global company's issue in one way. Yes. Mm. What's interesting about, about China is uh, this uh, duality. As mm -hmm. you said, on the one hand, we need to have a rule for the seventh continent, which our American friend needs to help us to implement in Europe and globally, and it's rebalancing, even though the competitive advantage at the beginning. On the other hand, China is proving, or uh, we've been working with some of the uh, competitors of Uber in China, proving that they, they can be national uh, champions that are providing alternatives to the global champions. Because otherwise we have this, uh, we had this with the computers, with IBM at some stage, we had this with the Toyota. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to be a balance and I think this is, this is what China is doing. So one hand, getting more inclusive with them. On the other hand, proving that uh, com firm, local firms can compete and stop this global firm. Yeah, that's right. That's something in the competition if you have the real good products, 
and it's to see if you can expand that kind of the products outside of your own national company, countries or something. You can be the global. The Toyota, this is, even though they, they operate in, in, in Japanese mainly, they are not operating all the factories in English. That's a de facto language, operating language. But still, the, their technology itself is maybe the uh, acceptable, that's applicable to so many other countries. So that the Toyota, even though that's still keeping this very big national the identity and the brand, still they can be this very much it's a global company. An important point is for the global company is, I think the, their competitive edge is the really the ethics. Keeping very good ethics, that is the most important. One of the in-house legal leader of the big global companies of the United States told us that they are not doing anything, it's just they are concentrating on the compliance and risk management and establishing the ethics of the company <coughs> and prevailing all that kind of stuff to the more than 100,000 the employees in the world. I think that is very much impressive. Many of these big firms insist on having a global culture, mm -hmm. and that's part of their communication. But is there such a thing as a global culture, or is it just a slogan, do you think? I can start. Um, I think that any company, any party, any institution, at the beginning, had its own singularity. You know, uh, and humans have a different uh, style and singularity, and this is what the founder or the founders created. Uh, that's right. Whether it's an American company, a French or a Japanese, it can be more like a, a king style, warrior style, farmer style. Mm -hmm. That will be the, the founding fathers, the founding that's mothers' right. uh, point. And then over time, as the company goes global, if you want to be inclusive, you need to bring in people that embrace this culture. And it looks global because you have, I have in my company 90, uh, 58 or 60 nationalities in 50 uh, countries. This is a global firm. Yeah. But at the end of the day, when we meet with the partners twice a year, 250 people in one location, we feel like the Knights of the Round Table. And I think this is what we have to understand is any company has its own singularity. And this is beyond nationalities. This is the human nature of people. I'd like to ask one of you, uh, each of you, sorry, um, if you had to give the name of one big firm that really symbolizes most your, uh, your, the country you come from, which would, would it be? You're American, is it, what would you say, Nelson? Coca-Cola. Sano-san? Because it's happy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm quite proud of the Toyota. <laughs> I guess I have to uh, name a French and a German. Uh, for the French, I would say L'Oréal because uh, we're all worth it. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And for Which the German, is half Swiss, yes. by the shareholders. But uh, again, uh, and for the German, I would say uh, BMW mm. uh, for the relationship to the machine and the way people uh, embrace this. So at least these firms really have a strong nationality then? Well, not nationality. Pride. I, 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 uh. I respect very much of the Johnson & Johnson with Credo. It's when they had a, it's a very much a huge difficulty in, this, in, the, in the market. It's, it's, uh, that some, uh, some the guy is to put the, some the poison oh, or the something. Oh, the Tylenol, yes. Yeah. Right. The poison so at the, that time, the Tylenol it's, it's, capsule. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Johnson & Johnson has a very good Credo. Credo means that it's the mission statement. And that is, is something that is very much impressive. I'm not, this is a, the, the Johnson, Johnson & Johnson is not our, our client at all, but still, they say that, that is one of the company I think, uh, is, uh, I, I, I like to say that that's really global and at the same time, good American company. We would like to uh, take a few questions if uh, some of you would like to uh, 
make a comment on 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 this or uh, you know let um, me wh while we're waiting to yes. see if what questions come let me make a, a somewhat provocative point that i made that i made behind about nationalities um, what, for years, when the American president goes to New York, the American president has stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, that great big hotel on Park Avenue. And every year during the UN General Assembly meetings, the president will go and stay there for a week usually and meet. This year, the president declined or was advised by his staff not to stay at the Waldorf Astoria. Why? Because it had been bought by a Chinese company. And they were not, they did not believe they could have intelligent security given the Chinese ownership and access to it. So they advised the president instead to go stay at the New York Palace Hotel, which is just two blocks away, fine choice, except that two months before the UN meetings, the New York Palace was bought by the Latte Group of South Korea. <laughs> and the president's advisors concluded it was okay to stay in a Korean hotel, but not to stay in a Chinese hotel. Korea and I, is a lie. <laughs> and, I think, and I think that really says a lot of the worst about today's world in which we brand companies by their nationality. Again, this was because of security and intelligence yeah. reasons. Yeah, that's right. But I can imagine why in China that would be perceived as a hostile move. Yes. There you yeah. go. Um, there is a difference, I think, between a company which produces something and a company which deal with startup of internet or anything like this. Being in a, coming from Israel, which is very strong in the area of uh, internet and all those startups, today the possibility to transfer a company from, of, I mean, of a high tech company, you don't have to move a factory or people or workers. You just send it through the internet don't need anything. It's a knowledge matter of fact. And there is a big, big competition in the world, of course, to attract companies to come to build their own factories or employ people in different countries. I think one of the main things which influence where to, be, to go is the taxes. That's the reason why many Israeli co companies, which are making a lot of money and as well doing very well, are listed not in Israel, but in different oh. other countries because of taxes tax ability. I, I, I would like to ask you what, what kind of uh, really influence have taxes over this possibility to be nationalized or to be just worldwide or to go to different places where there are tax shelters. I know that the OECD trying to make now new rules, trying to prevent possibility that big companies were not really using this point of possibility of low taxes in different places in order to prevent themselves from paying taxes to the governments in which they are, which also started also in regular companies trying to avoid the possibility of paying taxes to the state in which they are staying. Well, there's a famous saying in, in American law, uh, a famous judge said about 100 years ago, said, no American is required to pay any more taxes than they absolutely must. So we cannot fault them <laughs> for looking for any loophole that they can find. <laughs> Uh, and I think the same is fair to say for companies. No company wants to pay more taxes than they must. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for the OECD coming together to put together mm -hmm. common rules to ensure that there is a consistency uh, and that perhaps more often companies' tax citizenships will match their headquarters citizenships, will match their flag citizenships, will match their brand citizenship. On this point, but don't tell any of my clients I said that, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, on this point, the topic you mentioned is uh, the, where is the value-added produce and where is the consumer? Because uh, when you tax the profit, it's different than when you're taxing the service. And I think this is one of the topics that the uh, government needs to address. Because back to your point about uh, France, if you use the services of Apple and all the profits and taxes are going elsewhere, it's not really providing a value for the country. Yes? I think we discussed the issue of transfer price about 20 years ago. 
that's a very hot issue, mainly about the uh, trading goods. But as Jonathan said last, it's, it's, it's before this, this session, the now even the commodity, the real production cost or the value is less than 10%. It's a dot, it's invisible. Distribution or information or the sum of intellectual property rights and so on. And you can, you can create this many of the companies and in some way you can establish and transfer your address into the, not only the tax haven, but lightly taxed country. That is the, one of the issues that the European Union is now talking about and discussing to behave each other, that not to give the such kind of incentive to the, such a globally operating com companies. I think that is the one of the way to, to solve the question. But the, as I said, transfer price in goods, even the transfer price in goods itself it's not completely the captured. And transfer price in services, in the financial services or information technology services or any other services, invisible. It's not so easy. I think that's it's a very, very good question that the government have to tackle to not let the global operation completely free from the, some kind of the burden that they should pay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tatsuo Master from Japan. I have a very, very simple question. There are companies in the energy field like national oil companies, talking about Aramco or Gazprom, but there are quite interesting category like Statoil from Norway or Petronas from Malaysia. They are operating all over the world and uh, seems to be a quite good corporate citizen, a good global citizen. How do, could you call them global company or still national oil company? Just exact case of stopped oil from Norway and Petronas from Malaysia. Thank you. I can start, that's a difficult question, but uh, I think for me they are uh, national by origin and very strong nationalities and they are global by ambition. So let's not confuse the, the globalized company and uh, a company which is global by ambition and national by nature and uh, these companies are national by nature. Not just that, but I think when you look at where do their profits go, almost entirely their profits will be directed back to their government functions, either an investment fund or to direct government spending or paid through very high taxes to help support government entities. So I think uh, for those, I would, I would call them national actors. Well, this is, I'm not a tax lawyer, so this, I, can't, I can't say this is really. When you sound, talked identify. about transfer pricing, you sounded like a pretty good expert to me. <laughs> okay, but so you can, as you know, I think this so-called permanent establishment, the many of the global companies have the some subsidiaries or there's a distribution center or sales unit in one country. But many times they try to avoid to be a so-called permanent establishment status. The permanent st st establishment status can be taxable. But if you, you can avoid that kind of the PE status, you do not need to pay just cost and fee in that country. The many of the global companies or globally operating company try to have the some kind of advice from tax lawyer, not like me, okay? So I do not know this, what the start oil or some, what they are doing, but so we, we can say that those companies are globally operated, but very much patriotic. Clear in the many cases like Gazprom or others. Yes, sir. Thank you, um, Sebastian from Belgium. I, it's a really interesting discussion for developed economies, I guess, and for the whole 
the elements we've been touching upon. But what I'm wondering about a little bit is, is it different for developing economies? Because if you look at things like investments in Africa by huge Chinese corporations, does it have a different role in nationality? Is it more about security at that point and less about economics? Well, I, if I may, I would say that uh, many of the investments in China uh, are really designed just to acquire mineral resources for Chinese, for Chinese markets. So if they're investing in a mine, it's not to sell into the global markets, but to sell back to the Chinese markets. So I see that type of investment as being directly self-interested, in a sense, on the part of the on the part of the Chinese and in going into China and uh, making these investments and these acquisitions. You see the Chinese, for example, promising to go in and build a, a football stadium in, a, in an African country. And they bring all the cement, all the steel, all the workers, all the machinery from China. And when the project is done, they take it all back to China and have not employed a single African worker. Um, that's a different type of globalized investment, I think, than we've seen in the past. We had the chance to accompany some of these uh, Chinese companies into Africa, and uh, being French and with the history of France in Africa, I think they are doing it in a very different way, as you mentioned. Uh, they're also learning the hard way, because they think they operate... I mean, I'm back to my point at the beginning on how you manage a company. Everyone of us in this room the way we manage is pretty much parametered by the way we were legally trained with our, the country we operate. Again, the people we are driving and our culture. And when they came to, to Africa, our Chinese client was thinking, okay, I have a stable government. I want to get mining, mining rights. So I'm going to give him whatever he wants as a wish. Of course, then he asked for a stadium. I mean, this is a real case. Our team came to the village, big mine. There was a huge stadium. Why? because the uh, mayor, whatever we call it, uh, wanted to uh, see again the 1998 final between the France and Brazil in his village. Mm. So we built a 30,000 uh, stadium, which is now full of dust, and uh, there will be never any game there. So I think they're learning the hard way as well. And so when you're a global company, you're learning really the hard way because you're trying to operate the way you are in America, Japan, or France, or China. You're arriving in the middle of nowhere in an emerging market. And you're trying to apply your own rules, and very often it fails because you have a lack of understanding of the local environment. I think we have one more minute for question. For one question, if not, uh, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you. Thank you, Nicolas. <coughs> thank you.